going to have 20 to 30 minutes to kind of tell their story. And then we'll have Q&A afterwards for about 10 to 15 minutes with each speaker. So anything that you want to know about starting or running a business here uh, in a small town, um, these guys can give you can give you the insight. So we're going to start off with Dan Hinman, and he is the uh, owner of four Subway franchises. Um, three of which are in Ottawa, and then uh, two others out, out in Kansas. Um, Dan is a graduate of OU in accounting, so uh, if you guys want to welcome him, he's going to kind of share share his story, and uh, then we'll have Q and A Q&A right after he wraps up. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning, ladies. Um, I said she said I'm Dan and I'm I own the uh, two stores here in, in town. One nice to me and the one down at the, the Walmart store. And uh, we have a couple stores up in the North Central Kansas Concordia Play Center. Those were actually my first stores uh, many years ago. So um, I did graduate from here in accounting degree. Um, from here I went to K-State just briefly, working on a Master of Science in Accounting degree and decided that I really hated that. And <laughs> so I went and got a job, worked for Coke Industries for a couple of years as an accountant. And it finally clicked with me that I really hated being an accountant. So, you know, I can't do this. I, I cannot sit behind a desk as of driving nuts. And I also did not like the big corporate environment. Nothing wrong with it, but for me, I just didn't like it. I wanted to be out. I'm a people person. I wanted to be out with people. I just, it just drove me crazy. So, I started looking at some other opportunities. Um, and ran, at the time, ran across um, the subway concept. Now, granted, I had zero restaurant experience. None. I worked in a bank when I was in high school. I worked in a clothing store. No. So um, for me to get into the restaurant business, I thought you know, that, that, that was quite a change. I, my dad was a banker. I was around that all my life. Um, had no experience. But I was looking for something that I thought that I could do. Um, the reason why I guess I, get, I decided to get in to look at getting my own business, I guess, was um, I wanted to be able to see the direct result of my work. When I go and bust my tail all day long, I wanted to be able to see at the end of the day what the results were directly from what I had done. And so that's why I started looking for something else to do. And at the time, I ran across the Subway franchise. I liked it personally, just eating there. I've always been a sandwich guy. And uh, and so, I don't know, I just started pursuing that. I thought, you know what, I can do this. It looks like this is a concept that I can do. And so I started pursuing that and um, opened our first um, store up in Concordia. Kansas, which is North Central Kansas, a town of about 5,000 people. Um, when we first moved to go do that, Subway was pretty pretty new. I mean, there were probably 7,000 stores worldwide at the time, um, and that was considered a big change. Still is by standards. If you look at franchises, that's still a large change today. Um, but it was pretty relatively unknown. And we went into to Concordia, rural town, to, to sell sub sandwiches, most people thought nah, that's not going to fly. I can go and make a ham sandwich at home, and why would I want to come pay you to do that? Well, uh, I was told that many times. And so um, we started it. Um, first many years were uh, were a struggle. I began to think maybe they were right, but after a few years, we started learning some things and figured out how to make money with the, with the concept. But so that's how we got started. Um, and then over the years, um, we added our play center store. Um, again, when I started that, I thought maybe that was the dumbest thing I've ever done. Uh, it took a while for the small communities to accept us, but um, especially for being outside of town. Some of those small towns are a little clicky. <laughs> so, um, uh, but it, 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 over time, as we, as we uh, um, kept being persistent, um, we built sales and we were able to start being successful there. We had the opportunity to buy the stores out here in 2005, and so we, we moved to Ottawa, back to Ottawa here. So I kind of came full circle. But, um, part of the reason I like working for myself also, besides seeing the direct results of, of my work, um, is that I, I, uh, I, my days are really never the same. I, I kind of like that. I don't, I don't like going in and knowing what my day is going to be like. I kind of like that chaos to speak, I guess. You know, I'm kind of blunt for punishment, I don't know. But um, the, the going in and having the same routine every day bored me. And that's, that's part of the reason why I wanted to uh, get my own business. 
I like setting my own schedule um, as much as the business allows you to. Um, I do my own thing there. And um, I also like um, meeting the challenges that come up um, in problem solving. One of the things that when I first got into this business is um, they have a lot of, you know, franchising has a lot of help and stuff for you, but um, you still have to take it and apply it. And one of the things when we first got in business is I, I could not get the staff to buy into controlling costs and controlling formulas and doing those kind of things. And one of the challenges I have, like, well, how do I get them to care like I do? I mean, why should they care? I mean, they get paid, they come in, they do the thing, they get paid, they leave. Um, they're not getting paid a ton. Why should they care? Right? So I thought I could figure out a way to make them care. So after, after quite a while, I came up with a concept of um, using our, our meal policy as a way of incentive um, for them to wash formulas, wash the money over the short, and things like that. So if um, if they would meet certain standards each week, as we do our inventory each week, um, uh, and they meet within positive, you know, positive uh, parameters, then everybody as a group would earn their meals. Now, every time they come in and work at a shift, they get a free meal. So for students, you know, only over a week, you can get several meals, it's free, that saves a lot of money, right? It's like an extra paycheck in a way. And so, um, that, but you have to earn that as a group. Everybody succeeds, everybody fails. And so if you, if you don't meet those things, um, then there's, they don't get their meals, and then there's peer pressure on, don't get that sandwich away to your friend, and that's going to hurt me because that's going to reflect on our numbers. Or make sure you're following the formula unless the customer requests otherwise. Yeah, that's going to hurt us, you know. So anything that was un that we um, unaccounted for waste, we would we would factor in. So anyway, things like that, I like trying to tap. And um, so I was able to see the direct result of that. So we went from having a whole ton of waste to having not much waste at all. Everybody was buying in, and um, it, it seemed to work pretty well. And so that was one of the biggest things I did that, that actually start start being able to make some money with it, with the concept. But, um, I enjoy setting my own goals and trying to achieve. I also enjoy trying to compare to the other subway franchisees and seeing if I can beat them. You know, um, a little friendly competition um, amongst us. So that's a little bit about why I like working for myself. Um, Owning a franchise is is owning your own business, but in my opinion, and I might be wrong on this, but in my opinion, I don't think it's truly 100% entrepreneurial. Okay, um, because we are we are buying concepts that's already that an entrepreneur like Fred DeLuca already developed on his own and did, worked out the kinks in many ways, and then um, I'm I'm buying that knowledge, right? So in a way, it's, and I don't think it's totally entrepreneurial. The entrepreneurial part comes in, how do you, how do you use that in your particular situation, right? And make that as, as successful as you can be. Like the problem solving um, concept that I came up with, with uh, food costs and things like that. So is a franchise really 100% entrepreneurial? I don't think so. It is somewhat not totally, okay. Um, but for me, that was a good choice, right? I had zero restaurant experience. So it's probably good for me to use a concept. Now, I could go now and probably do it. I could go do my own thing now, probably. Maybe I'd be successful, maybe I wouldn't, I don't know. But I'd have a better shot at it now, for sure. Um, do you implement the system you purchase and you try to make it as successful as you can in your unique situation? Um, and you're paying to be able to use a proven um, system. Um, in order to be okay with owning a franchise and operating a franchise, you gotta be okay with not being able to do it your way all the time, right? Um, this is our franchise agreement, or uh, disclosure, okay? It's gotten a little thicker over the years, but pretty much you do it their way. Okay, you're buying the system, you do it their way, and that's a good thing, it's a bad thing. They're wanting consistency across the board, they're wanting to protect their idea, their brand, um, just like your dad, he can't do with the uh, with the um, uh, heat wave down here. Um, he, he, he can't they can't do the, just whatever he wants to do. You got to follow certain guidelines and so forth, right? So same way with us, uh, we have to um, we have to do um, follow the rules. Um, but 
So if you're if you're truly entrepreneurial sometimes and you want you get in and you want to do your own thing, that can really be great. Um, my father-in-law owned these stores before I did. He could not take that. He could not do it. It was because he kept butting up against their work. Um, uh, so if you're gonna do a franchise, you gotta understand is become at peace with that that you can't do it there, you can't do it there. Okay. Um, the positive about owning a franchise, one is, like I said, it's a proven system. A lot of the kings have been worked out. You have a lot of leverage with just the combined numbers of, of stores that there are. Um, as far as purchasing power, um, really um, all the subways together have that power, not just yourself in many ways. Okay? Um, for instance, with products, subway owners went together quite a few years ago to start a uh, purchasing cooperative. And so they have professionals that buy all of the different uh, uh, products and so forth, negotiate our prices and contract with the growers and the meat packers and so forth. And so it helps get us a lower price overall in large <laughs> quantities. And so when natural disasters or weather events happen with, with products and so forth, we don't see quite the spikes in product and so forth um, costs that, that um, mom and pop shop might. So that protects us a little bit there. So again, we're getting some good um, benefit. Um, from that, from you, from all of us together. Okay. I could never do that, I'm just talking about it, right? Um, advertising, same thing. Um, it's a lot, of, when they print off thousands and thousands and thousands of window signs, um, buying radio ads, TV ads, what have you, um, again, we have that um, economies of scale there, so it's a lot less expensive per piece than working with the block, less expensive, over what I can go down to um, the printer shop and so forth these days and uh, print on my own. Now, technology actually has helped bend that curve a little bit um, with um, social media and with um, um, online um, uh, products like fast signs and things like that. Some of, those, some of those costs are actually reducing quite a bit um, just because of efficiencies they have with some of that. But um, so um, there are, in today's world, it is, uh, there probably are some that probably brought those two items closer as far as cost, but, but still you have a lot of benefits with that. Now sometimes even just as simple as um, Office Depot, um, they have a big contract with them, so I can go in there and get things a lot cheaper than somebody who's off the street can do. So some benefits to that. You have a lot of uh, support um, legal-wise uh, most of the time, um, just in trying to move, find advice on locations, um, those kind of things. So, so you get a lot of support there. Um, and generally, um, doing a franchise, you have a higher success rate generally than just starting something on your own. Um, but um, that's not necessarily your key. <laughs> okay? Just because you have a franchise doesn't mean you're going to be successful. Um, sometimes it's easier to get financing just because they know it's a proven concept. Sometimes not. But, um, and then another, one other positive thing too is a lot of times it's a little bit easier to sell that concept to somebody else if it's a good franchise. Okay. So, um, so next some negatives. As the chain goes, we go right. Um, we've all heard about here recently, right? <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> talk about easy money making. We just throw it all away. But um, that that reflects on the chain, right? Everything that happens with that name from Subway. We all get to bear that um, that burden, right? So, and um, yoga mats, right? The whole thing of a, a year or so ago about that like that lady that came on there saying, "Hey, subway in their subway bread, they had the same thing as in yoga mats." Well, sort of, not really, but it's got a lot of attention. Um, it actually was a chemical that's in there that, that helps with elasticity. It is in almost every commercial bread out there, every fast food chain. Almost every bread on the show, unless it's organic. Okay, but they got a lot of headlines, a lot of attention, you know. And we saw our sales dip. So as as subway as subway goes, we go. Um, you are not in control of many aspects, as I said, um, and you pay for it. Off the top, gross, pay twelve and a half percent. So eight percent for royalties before. Anything else before I take anything, and then four and a half advertising. 
Now it's not all bad, but it's a cost, right? Right off the bat, 12 and a half percent. So when I look at my advertising budget, I have to consider I'm already spending four and a half percent of gross on advertising, and um, then I have to take, make my decisions from there. Uh, what else am I going to do? Okay. Um, agreements are very one-sided. You know that going in. I had my attorney look at this when we first, and it's gotten worse over the years. We've gone from 7,000 stores to 40,000 stores worldwide, which in my opinion is too many. But, um, my attorney looked at this, he said, you got a crazy assignment. Yes, <laughs> probably, because uh, it's all great as long as things are going well. But if you get crossways with them somehow, that, that business can be closed in a second and given to somebody else. Now, it's not quite as simple as that, but pretty close. Okay, I mean, you really have very, very few rights. Um, you can go and it goes to arbitration, but they, they pretty much make sure that they know. Okay. And um, that's to protect their brand and, and so forth. But you know they want in. <coughs> so if things go bad, it's not a surprise. <laughs> okay? I mean, it's just, it's just not. If you if it is to you that you weren't paying attention and didn't do your homework, okay. Um, probably um, one of the biggest challenges I had in, in when I first got into the, doing the subway is learning again, learning how to make a profit. I mean, they had the system, but I had to learn how to use that system or what worked well in our scenario and what didn't. Some things are requirements, some things are recommendations. For instance, pricing. They can't tell me what I have to charge. Okay, technically, they find ways to manipulate that. But, but, so when we first got in, we had the recommended pricing we charged. They they said you need to have about thirty, make sure you have about thirty to thirty-three percent food cost when you do your pricing. If you follow our pricing, you'll have about that. Um, if you control your formulas and everything, which we already talked about and how I figured that out. But. Um, I, we went for three or four years with their recommended pricing. Can make you money? Why are we not making any money? We got customers, people coming in. The ad, we're, we're hitting the averages. Well, I, I finally ran into an accountant who did a lot of uh, restaurants in his business. He said, "Dan, if you don't, if your food cost—I don't care what Subway says—if your food cost is not thirty percent or below, you're going to go broke." Okay. Well, Subway had their lower food cost and their lower pricing because they had volume, right? So, um, so we find that well, I'm going to go broke. I may as well. Um, I thought I was the first five years. Um, I may as well go broke trying to at least make some money. So I adjusted our prices, made sure every sandwich was within that range. And lo and behold, we started making money. So. Um, So learning how to make that, how to make a profit, learning um, <laughs> those lessons was probably the biggest thing. How to use that tool, but then how to what make what changes I could make um, was important. Um, learning how to control my expenses. You know, we talked about that with food costs. That was one of the biggest things. Um, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. You got to watch your cash. Um, if you don't, you need to, oh, oh, so when you first get in business, you see all this money coming in, but you don't realize how, how much money, yeah, there's all this cash in my bank account. So all of a sudden, you get a call from the bank, and say, Dan, you're overdrawn. Wait a second, I had this money coming in. Why? This is when I first got in, when I first started. And I realized shortly that you really get, you got to watch. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Um, and if you have a lot of money coming in, you got a lot of money going out. And if you're not on top of it, um, you're, you're going to find yourself not having that money with payroll all of a sudden, or what have you. You go to the bank and say, hey, can you help me? And they say, oh, I'm sorry, but you can't. And you're done. So, and is profit the same as cash? Is profit the same as cash? No, not necessarily. Right? You got inventory, payroll costs, utilities, royalties, advertising, insurance, workman's comp, IT costs. Um, just, just basic repairs, subscriptions, bank fees, pest control fees, government fees, taxes, financing costs. The list goes on, right? All wanting that, that dollar. So you want to make sure you watch your cash when you're setting it aside. Um, make a budget, stick to it. You've probably heard that a thousand times in every business class you've been in, and it's really true. You really need to know what, to, 
think you're going to spend and then be monitoring that all the time. And then one of the biggest things that Sean does is we can't say yes to everybody that comes in your door wanting help, wanting, wanting support. I try to say yes, and I think Sean probably does too, as much as we can. And we donate a lot of food. Um, we get money once in a while, we usually try to do food. But you can't do it to everybody. You've got you to gotta watch, that costs you something. You've got to watch your expenses. So you really need to make sure, that, again, those kind of things are factored in. Because you, you, every day you'll get somebody coming in and wanting something. It's not, they're not legitimate, it's just that um, you just can't do everything. One of the tools I really re recommend, um, and how am I doing on time here? Okay, 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 I'm, I'm good on One of the tools that I've come across that helps me with my cash flow, financial statements, um, income statement gives you a picture of what's happened in the past, right? And they're valuable. I mean, it, it teaches you a lot of things. And you can see, okay, well, based on what I see here, I can, I maybe I need to make some changes over here. Um, but I ran across the, the concept of um, software called envelopes, and there's lots of things like it out there, but that helps me look more forward with my cash. When you look at your bank account, you see cash there. Really what you're seeing, what you should be seeing is that, yeah, you have dollars there, but you've got, that's, those are all committed to something already, generally, and hopefully you have a little bit left over for profit. Okay, hopefully, hopefully a little more, but, but those, and really when you look at that, you really should not look at that as just cash, you need to look at it as all the things you've committed to, all the things I've listed on. So what I've done is we have a, we use this uh, software called envelopes where it's just like the old fashioned thing. You take paper envelopes and put money in there. Now I know I'm going to have this much money for utilities. I'm going to have this much money for for uh, um, you know um, repairs. I'm going to have this you know whatever it may be. You know, you know, it's just like that old fashioned system. So I take our our, our budget, I put it into that, I have each fund, and it, and I you fund that is with that with with your cash. And as you go, you have your expenses, you meet your expenses, you're watching that, and you're watching how much do I have that envelope less left for those kinds of expenses. And what that does is it helps me, if I get down to zero, I know I've, I've got a problem, I've overspent that, so I either got to take it from something else, or I got to find another source of revenue somehow. But what it does, instead of helping me look at something that's already been done, nothing I can do about that in the past, right? The financial savings is done. I can't do anything about all those expenses paid in. It's helped me look more forward and be able to say, okay, be more more proactive and help control my costs um, in advance. So that's been something that's really helped me as far as my, my cash flow, just food for thought. And that's something you can use for in your personal life um, too, actually. So financial statements are great, but um, they tell you what already happened. If you can be to think ahead and watch what's going to happen. Um, probably one of the other biggest challenges we had, um, mainly with, with, with owning a franchise, particularly, is <laughs> Subway makes their money on the top, right? They make their money off the royalties and the advertising money that we have to come in, that they have to come in 12%, 12.5%. I make my money on what's left. But do you think that creates a problem? What kind of problem could that create, I guess? Uh, to some extent. I mean, I think they, they do, but yet our focus is different, right? I mean, their focus is on volume, 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 volume. They want as many sales as possible, right? Because that's what they're going to make their money. Is that always good for me? No. Now, one, one example of that was um, the $5 football thing that happened for many years. Um, it could debate whether it was a good thing for the chain or not. Um, I was already making money. I'd already found a good balance between profit, um, in between uh, volume and, and pricing and, and uh, um, the amount of profit and so forth. And I, I was happy with what we were doing. And then Subway came along and decided, there's a lot of stores apparently that weren't. And so they did the $5 football thing to drive sale. Well, my pricing now is much, much less than it was seven, eight years ago. That's called what? We always talk about inflation, right? That's major deflation. Okay. So um, it was good. We could generate a lot of volume, but we had to we had to work three times harder 
um, for the same amount of money. Um, Subway made a lot of money. Um, yeah, we, we kicked the competition in the teeth quite a bit during that time. Um, but it really, um, for the franchisee, at least for us, I felt like, and there's different opinions out there, but in my opinion, it hurt us because I, I, I could have made the same amount of money with a lot less effort without having to wear out my staff, without having to wear out my equipment. Um, it, it, it just, for me, it just wasn't a good thing. We, it was a different focus. They made a ton of money. Okay. And then they did it, what they did the next problem is they went even longer and um, it took it too long. They started doing it more often during the year. So instead of becoming a special, it changed the price of our product totally with the value of our product and what a sandwich is worth in the eyes of the customer. Then a sandwich is only worth five bucks. That's it. Instead of being a special, it became that's all for. So now that's what we're finding. How do you how do you get back to where you were? How do you make the changes? Because now I'm not doing it because we can't afford to either. We finally started not seeing the big bang for the buck. Everybody was doing it. It got diluted, and so now it wasn't being as effective. Even so, okay. So now here we are. So I've got a pricing structure now, much much less by a dollar or so on footballs than what I had six seven years ago. So. Maybe it was overpriced then, maybe so, I don't know. But probably somewhere in the middle would have been nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's one thing with franchises is that you, you have different, and I might, at least at least in our setup, there might be some that are different, but most are the same. Most most make their money on the top. And uh, so that gives the owner and the, and the franchise or a different focus, okay? And that could somebody, sometimes be wrong. Um, Employees and training, just real briefly, that's probably always one of the hardest parts of the job. Um, and that, that is, is becoming much, much more of an issue. Um, traditionally, we'd always had uh, teenagers um, and sometimes college students working as a, as a job to get through school. You know, not a lot of, really not a lot of adults were relying on that for their sole income. Okay, it was a part-time thing. Things have changed a lot in our society the last many years. And now we have a lot of people working for us who it is their sole income. For whatever reasons, we get into all societal reasons and this, that, and the other, but the fact is we have many, many people who are young people who are not going to go to college or who uh, or who are older adults who are working fast food jobs that were never really meant to be of uh, uh, something that somebody has a whole livelihood on. But here we are. So now we all know the big debates going on, right, about living wage and the fight off at the $15 an hour. Now our problem is a lot of these concepts are not built on that. And so we gotta figure that out somehow. Because, because it's not gonna change, here we are. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges right now that I gotta try to figure out. How do you meet people's needs and yet, and deal with reality, because that's reality, because we are where we are. Um, and, and yet um, still make a profit, right? So um, that's probably the biggest challenge I have now and then I mean, get me started on the um, Portable Care Act. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great in theory, nobody has a clue what's going on with the part of it. Not even insurance companies. Call insurance agents and the answer is I, have no, I don't know them. Um, okay. So um, that is that's um, that is a big a big challenge for us right now. Um, if you want to buy a franchise, um, do your homework. There's all kinds of different ones out there. Some good, some bad. I would pick one that has been around for a little bit, but doesn't have a ton of stores because that creates a lot of opportunity. But if they've been around a little bit, they've probably got a good system. Okay. Um, talk to existing franchisees, they'll give you the real scoop on things on that chain. The franchisor is going to tell you the rosy picture. And they can't tell you numbers and that kind of thing. Franchises can, okay, um, to some extent. Um, and then just pick a you know pick a franchise that, that matches your interest. Obviously, you just still got if you're not interested in what you're doing, it's it's a lot of work for that. Um, working for yourself can be very rewarding. Um, you know, it, it is it's one of the best ways to create to create wealth. But there's no guarantees, you know. And if you don't want to, if you want to have your weekends off and work nine to five, 
forget it. <laughs> I mean, it's just not, at least initially, at least for many, many years, maybe after you get into it a while and, and you've got um, things established, yeah, you might, you might be able to do that. But um, it's, it's just constant. But it's fun. If you like that kind of thing, it's fun for the most part. So, okay. Um, a lot of ways society and government is not friendly to business right now, in my opinion. I know that can be debated, but in my opinion, that's the case. And so that's a challenge, um, and um, that's kind of the scenario. <laughs> so that's what I got. Um, I don't know how much we're on that time and so forth. But, uh. Well, we'll uh, just open it up for, for about five minutes of questions. Mr. Hinman, if you guys have any questions about the franchise system or, or running a business, feel free to, to, to voice those. <laughs> um, the Main Street one here at that time, the, that one, the Concordia store, I'm talking about. Um, although our Concordia store, you know, it's only a town of 5,000 people, that's right on Highway 1, and we do go there, and I've kind of <laughs> and, um, So it does really well, although we have new RVs open up there, which is a town of 5,000 people, they have a new concept open up. Like, oh my gosh, we, <laughs> you know, because it's an hour drive to anything else. You know? <laughs> so that's kind of personal. So a town of 5,000 can get an Arby's and Ottawa can? Yes. Interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So far. Actually, I thought that's what was going to go in down there. At, uh, KFC. Arby's have bought up a lot of old KFCs. <laughs> so I really thought that was what was going to go in there. Was the uh, startup procedure different in different communities as far as local laws or ordinances? Or were they about um, the same? Pretty much the same. Um, Ottawa's a little tougher, actually. Ottawa's a little unique when you go working with um, um, zoning and, and just different things. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just it's a little tougher. But, um, but and it's pretty much the same. And you know, the cost of getting in the subway is a little less than what a lot of concepts are. But, uh, less initially, and they have a little higher loyalty. Kind of so. Any other questions? Anything else? Um, you know, the, uh, as far as how much the franchise costs, the price differ, but they don't pay for like a lot of energy issues. Sometimes, I mean, yeah, because you. Because the cost of development, you have you have the franchise fee, but then you have all the rest of it, right? Depending on if you're going to rent something or if you're going to build a building, that kind of thing. Um, um, yeah, so it it can be it can depending on your area. How much is land or how much is it? Uh, I'm talking specifically about the franchise fee. Oh, the franchise fee. Okay. Generally, it's the same across the board. Yeah. I had one more when you said too many forty thousand worldwide. What? Why? Why do you say that? That bigger is not necessarily yeah. better. What what's happening that you feel like that's a disadvantage? I, I think we're we're at a point where we're hurting ourselves sometimes. You know, especially in the metropolitan areas, you get you get a subway every stake of corner practically, and and their averages in Kansas City are not that great. Um, I think you start cannibalizing yourself back a while. So that is the main thing. Yeah. Here's, um, um, yeah. I mean, they're they're wanting me to put another store up on the northeast side of here. And uh, no, I'm not going to do it. I mean, it's got to be the right situation, right? Uh, I'd like to be able to move this store down here eventually and put a drive through and that kind of thing, you know, if I can find the right situation. But but I just think there's too many stores. Uh, can they force you to put a third store? I know some franchise contracts. You have do you have this territory or something? Well, nothing, nothing official. We don't have anything. Some of it is not guarantee areas. Um, some franchises do that. They could put somebody in there. I could argue it, um, but um, the only thing I have for putting somebody from not putting something in there is that our friend, our uh, development agents, word that you know, they're not going to do it because they, they, they want to get our, they want to have a good relationship with us too. But they could. 
And again, that's one of those things, the crazy part of signing sometimes these agreements. You take a chance on them sometimes. And, um, when the loves came in, I was worried they were going to put one in there because um, loves are a lot of subways. And um, fortunately, we're going to argue that I'm not allowed that. But I um, just not concerned about that. Anything else? Tell you a little bit about how our family historically got to where we were at and kind of the path that I took as we'll take a little brief interlude there in the middle and talk about how I got to where I'm at in there too. Um, so our our story starts way way back in the early 1900s. This is my grandfather as a teenager. They rented some property out by Richter, which is out by Pomona family was really interested in horticulture from the get-go. You can see him there with his watermelons. You don't have to go much past his generation back into the family before you hit that borderline German Baptist, almost Amish, uber conservative kind of folks. And so a lot of our family elders are on that more conservative kind of track, which has caused some challenges as we have gone along. Uh, 1940s, my grandfather started the greenhouse in 1936, and it was an old rock and glass structure out on the farm that I still live on. Uh, had an old Chevy truck that they delivered with. And there's my dad in the 50s. He was born in 46 and was very much a diversified farm. So there was a greenhouse, but they also had beef cows and dairy cows and chickens and ducks and uh, had corn and beans and wheat and they milked cows uh, and then all of a lot of the local farmers grew sorghum, which was syrup sorghum that was about 14 to 15 feet tall. Squeeze the juice out of that, cook it down into a honey-like substance or molasses type sorghum syrup. And uh, he had the, the mill and would do that for a lot of the local people. Uh, to supplement income at that point, he also worked at the ice plant in several different places around town. So uh, when we see entrepreneurs working additional jobs or, or doing things that are outside of their industry, not a new concept. This is the old family farm in 1954. Uh, the road, this is Osborne Terrace now, goes along here, and the old greenhouse is right there. You'll soon see a picture of the greenhouse dad expanded to in the 70s, and it takes up a half acre spot, which is approximately half of a football field. So, 1960s, my grandparents primarily ran it together. Uh, dad was one of three kids, but his brother and his sister were 17 and 19 years older than he was, and so he was essentially raised as an only child with much older parents. And so he grew up in the greenhouse, and uh, Grandpa got in poor health while he was at K-State, and so in five years at K-State, my dad never actually spent a weekend in Manhattan or went to a sporting event, because he was coming back helping with the farm in the greenhouse every weekend. Then in the 70s, after Dad finished up at K-State, he expanded the greenhouse to a half an acre. And these are what are called gutter-connected ranges, but there were 10 houses, 18 by 96, each connected by a gutter. And at that point, we had wholesale and retail both. A lot of retail of people coming out to the greenhouse, a lot of wholesale with that he had a truck driver that went to other flower shops and greenhouses within a 100-mile range to sell the goods. Uh, the state of the art for its time in 1975, there's a lot of things about the technology that is way, way back in the Stone Age at this point, but a lot of things that are still applicable too. 
Um, the 1980s, at 8th and Hickory, there are some, some houses and duplexes down at 8th and Hickory. That was an old greenhouse and flower shop called the Osborne Greenhouse and Florist. In the late 70s, Dad bought it in addition to our farm location. And so uh, parades were a huge, huge deal in the 80s. A couple of different Christmas parade floats that Dad had for the greenhouse and the flower shop. This was a really warm Christmas parade. Poinsettias don't like to be under 60 degrees. It was like 65, 70 degrees on the December day that they had the parade in 1980. And so this was a buggy covered in cedar greens and live poinsettias. Fantastic float. You'll never see one like it again just because of weather constraints. And a couple of years later, um, had a sleigh mounted on the van. This is the old Osborne greenhouse that was at 8th and Hickory. It was an old, old, glass structure that had been built in the early 1900s, very dated. Uh, there were some large diesel tanks underneath the property that uh, the EPA, of course, today would have a fit with. Dad stuck a pump down in there and heated the place with it for several years because <laughs> it had just been left behind, but it was good for fuel oil. And then newspaper, one of the biggest things that has changed since that time, newspaper advertising was huge. Anything you put in the newspaper, everybody in town would see it, you would know what was going on. So those are some ads that we've had from the 80s. So budding entrepreneurial desires, this is me as a small child, much like dad grew up as an only child with older parents. Dad was 40 when I was born, I was an only child, never went to preschool, did that sort of thing. So I essentially grew up with older parents and a lot of first cousins that were age 40 and above. And so consequently, my kindergarten teacher knew me as a little old man, and my nickname through much of school was Grandpa, because I just had kind of an old soul, because that's what I'd grown up around, was, was working with adults. And so transplanting and watering and helping little old ladies carry their plants to their car, by the age of six, I had to know how to count change back. My mom was in banking for 20 years, so having all of your bills facing forward and right side up and in sequential order and being able to count change was a huge, huge deal. <clears throat> so a little intermission there. Grew up in the greenhouse, enjoyed it, but uh, felt that there was no place in agriculture for me. It was hard work, it was hot, it didn't make money to my perception. So to me, that was the part of farming that I knew and I couldn't go back to that because it was hard work and it didn't make me money. And there was the ranching side of agriculture that I knew nothing about at that point. So my assumption at that point was I know nothing about it. I can't go to that either. So at that point, my dream and aspiration was to be an architect. I would clear off the coffee table at home, have large pieces of white paper, draw elaborate floor plans, ridiculous floor plans, and was planning through most of my school years to go into architecture. Dad had gone to K-State. Of course, I had architecture is big at K-State. That's where I was going to head. No brainer. Then uh, getting into high school, got involved with the FFA. How many former FFA members do we have in the room? I know of a couple. Okay, it's just you and me, Garrett, sweet. So FFA had been shut down at Ottawa in 1964 when my dad was a senior in high school. They were moving to a new building, the teacher was retiring, they were trying to save money on a bond issue, got rid of the program. 37 years later, they brought it back when I, ironically, was a freshman in high school. We started with like 11 or 12 kids, headed up to 75 or 80 by the time I was a senior. Developed my leadership skills, developed my interest in agriculture, got me really thinking about that there were some other aspects of agriculture that I could get into that were outside of what I had known growing up and that I might want to do that. And so on senior day when I went to K-State, I was planning to go into agriculture technology management. I was going to run a John Deere dealership. It was going to be sweet. I was going to get to drive new tractors all day. And went up for the tour and was very unimpressed with the number two guy that I had talked with. The number one guy was gone. And I'd had several people through my high school and FFA career say, gee, Sean, you would make a great teacher. So I went and visited the Ag Education Department, really liked it, stuck with it for four years. Ended up with a degree in Agriculture Education and Horticulture. Uh, was planning to teach for a little bit, but not too ter terribly long, because between my freshman and sophomore year of college, it was 19 years old, get home for the summer, and mom and dad said, hey, we're thinking about buying a flower shop again. I said, you're what? <laughs> okay. And so that summer between my freshman and sophomore year came back, I had just had some economics classes there my freshman year. And so using what I'd learned in those, I wrote the business plan and did the cash flow projections for the new flower shop. When I was a kid, 
And we had the other flower shop, and even after we'd sold it, there were five flower shops in Ottawa, which is hellaciously way too many flower shops for Ottawa. And all of my childhood, I remember Dad saying, gosh, if Ottawa gets down to two flower shops, we need to have one of them. Well, in 2006, there were four flower shops in Ottawa, and three of them were for sale. And we knew that was either a really good sign or a really, really bad sign. But we were going to dive in with both feet anyway, because why not? So the intermission there, that's what happened between elementary school and adulthood. Multiple majors, third career choice, from architecture to John Deere leadership management to education. Oh, wait, now we've got flower shops. That should have said fourth. And so while our family's history has helped, they're from 1936 to the mid-90s when we shut down the greenhouse. A lot of our customers from that time are now either, well, to be quite blunt, a lot of them are deceased at this point from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and don't remember the legacy that was started by my grandfather. And so in 2006, even though there were a lot of people that remember getting plants and things from us at Farmer's Market when I was a kid, we were really starting from scratch in a lot of ways. So graduated from OHS in 2005, really involved with FFA, got involved with Farm Bureau. This is the College of Agriculture logo for K-State. Many people, when they think of K-State, think of farmers and agriculture. 10% of the student body is agriculture at K-State. They hold like 80% of the leadership positions, but 10% of the student body is agriculture. I think that's, that's an important consideration. So Turner Flowers today. Um, this is our downtown location, 231 South Main. Our second location is our satellite cooler that is in the hospital gift shop at Ransom Memorial. That has continued to grow and grow over time. So we have, uh, you notice on the sign there, it says, and country store. I like to say that's an old Indian term that means I'll sell whatever I darn well please. Um, one of the benefits that we have to Dan's situation is that uh, mom and dad and I are all one third owners. We bought it together there while I was in college. Um, while I was at K-State, I came back summers and about every other weekend, learned the trade from dad, floral design. And so really the three of us get to call the shots. And when it comes right down to it, he was raised an only child, mom's an only child, I'm an only child. If any two of us can decide on something, the third one's just going to have to roll with it. Uh, we do a lot, of, a lot of really custom pieces, especially for funerals and weddings. This was an old gentleman's cowboy hat that we put in a casket spray. We've gotten into a lot of specialty products. Uh, one challenge of our industry is that just like Dan has to have a human to put together every sandwich, we have to have human hands to put together every arrangement. It becomes very time consuming, very tedious. And so the more products that we can add in that people can grab off the shelf and go, particularly products that they are going to consume and want to purchase again, is huge. So you see Sweet Shop USA up there in the top right. Those are truffles that are hand dipped in Texas. They dance, tried them by the desert. Did she share with you? Your wife shared. That's impressive. <clears throat> so they are, they're like the size of golf balls. They're hand dipped in Texas and they're the same truffles you can get at Disneyland. And what better tagline than it's cheaper to stay here and eat our truffles than to go to Disneyland? Because it is. Um, homes made salsa, cowboy candy, jalapeno relish, stuff that's made down in Wichita, hand lotions. All those types of things that people are going to consume, like, and want to consume again that keeps them coming in on a more regular basis rather than just coming in on their wife's birthday and their wife's anniversary. So that's been a big, big deal for us. Small Business Saturday, you may have heard about with American Express, because the Saturday after Thanksgiving, it's been a huge promotion item for us. If you haven't heard a lot about it, go online and look at Small Business Saturday. From the land of Kansas is another thing that's benefited us a lot. That is a specialty program through the Kansas Department of Agriculture that helps promote small businesses and Kansas-made, Kansas-produced products. Most of the cut flowers that we use are shipped in from Ecuador and Colombia. Because we assemble them into arrangements here, they are considered a Kansas-made agricultural commodity. Ironic. Much like a cow can be 51% black and be certified Angus beef. Right, Mrs. Becker? <laughs> That's up. I could take a whole other hour with that one. So love and hate to business ownership. Just like Dan said, the hours are crap. Um, if I can't remember the, the last time that I had two Saturdays in a row off. We're 9 to 5 Monday through Friday, 9 to noon Saturday. Sunday I was at the shop because one of the funeral homes had a funeral visitation, so I had to go in 
one o'clock, get the flowers out of the cooler, meet the funeral director at the funeral home, get that set up for the visitation. Having a full day off is fantastic, but it is rare. Yeah. <laughs> duties. There are a lot of duties that you have as an entrepreneur that you would not have as an employee of another business. All the things that Dan mentioned from payroll to staff management to ordering to managing a percentage cost of goods, uh, a lot of different things. But when there is payoff, that payoff is all yours. And the payoff is fantastic because you're the one that created it. And so there's a lot of benefit there. A lot of extra paperwork. Money with question marks. Uh, I taught for two and a half years. One of those semesters was a student teaching semester. Two years was paid at Spring Hill Schools. Still came back evenings and weekends and helped in the flower shop while I was teaching full time. It was like having two full time careers. Lordy, it sucked. But because I was on the payroll of the school for two years, I had a salary. And so while the flower shop was growing and was not at the point yet that it could support three salaries, I had a salary coming in but could still help to grow the business. That was good. Having that W-2 for two years helped my credit rating to go up so that I was able to purchase my own farm and to help buy into the business. That was good. Uh, so even though it wasn't initially what I wanted to do full time, it had a whole lot of perks that went with it that going out and having that outside job while I was getting things rolling and getting my stuff together uh, made a big, big difference. So then some, some joys and some loves there. I don't know how well you can see the screen. This is a bridal bouquet that has an antler and shotgun shells in it. The antler was shot by the bride. It was the first deer that she shot when she was nine years old. The bride and the groom went target shooting and had me make shotgun shell roses out of the shells that were left. Really fun wedding to work with. A little red net. Bride and groom had matching gauges with their duct tape and burlap. I don't judge. That's cool. <clears throat> had a phone call from a movie producer in Hollywood. He will rename, uh, remain unnamed for his protection. Uh, he didn't call me, his assistant didn't call me, but his second assistant called me. And they knew the son of somebody that had passed away, the service was at Dingles. And this fellow was, you could tell he was California cultured. I'm sure he held his little finger up when he drank coffee, but that's fine. And he was looking at our website and he goes, I really like this arrangement. I said, great. He says, can you do something bigger? I said, sure, how much bigger you want? Well, how much is that one? And the one he pointed out on the website, it was like $125. And that's for just a business calling in for a funeral. That's a good size piece. He says, oh, I want to spend about $500. Deal. <laughs> and so this is a cut crystal punch bowl with about five dozen roses and about a dozen and a half calla lilies in it for his 500 bucks. And in order to deliver that, it slid into the back of our Chevy Suburban, and then I sat on the floor in the fetal position holding it up while the delivery guy drove about 12 miles an hour to get over to the funeral home. What in the tar they did with it after they got there, I don't care. <clears throat> uh, gotten featured in a few magazines. I've got published in Florist Review about three times. It was on the cover of Kansas Living last spring. A year and a half later, I still have people that pop into our shop that say, I've never been in before, but I saw you on the cover of Kansas Living, and I thought I'd come check it out. And you can't buy advertising like that. And so that's one of the really fun parts of the job. And then one of the rewarding, not fun, but one of the more rewarding parts is helping people that you know when they are having more sad times. This was a casket piece that I did for a good friend's mother. Uh, five kids in the family. The family's signature is red roses. They wanted a lot of red roses, but somehow wanted to signify the five kids. So we've got the five yellow roses in there. They wanted five rainbow roses. They weren't available. That's a whole other story for a whole other day. Um, for a meat butcher that, er, that passed away, we put meat cleavers in the casket piece. I've done cowboy hats. We've done cowboy boots. I've done stuffed raccoons, scarves, purses, high-heeled shoes. Whatever people bring in, they're not going to start with me because we've almost seen it all as far as the goofy stuff that they want to put in funeral pieces that, that is meaningful to them. <coughs> so resources of getting started, developing a network, things like the Chamber of Commerce. If you haven't visited with the Development Council, I encourage it. They have got major labor studies and documents as far as what industries are needed in this area. 
and whatever area you want to be in, they will have that sort of data at a development council. I don't know if they'll have it at the quality and the level that we are fortunate enough to have in Franklin County, but they have that data. And so if you go and look at those numbers, you can see if the industry that you're excited about exercising your entrepreneurial spirit in is or isn't something that's in demand. In my opinion, we really need a coffee shop, an evening type coffee shop downtown where high school and college students can go study, there'd be comfy leather couches, have a cappuccino, listen to some music, something like that. I've seen some franchises that would really do it. I just don't have $200,000 to do it right at the moment. Dan, why don't you jump on that? Oh, <laughs> So, uh, Kansas Small Business Development Center, they're based out of KU, I won't hold that against them, they've got some great free resources. The extension service is through K-State. Um, extension is the same extension that runs 4-H and a lot of different programs around the state. They also have a lot of business development tools and a lot of research that is available to you as a taxpaying customer in the state of Kansas. Traveling and being snoopy, when we want to go somewhere, and granted all three of us have been all gone away from the shop at the same time, twice in eight years. Because one of the reasons our businesses are successful is because at least one of us is there at all times. When people come in the door to Turner Flowers, they expect to see a Turner in the shop. And so by making sure one of us is there, it helps with quality control and it gives the customer a little bit more of a comfort level because they know if one of us is there, it's going to get done right, it's going to get done their way. We're finally getting to the point that we have a staff developed that we can leave alone a little bit more, but we can't abuse it because it'll ruin a good thing. But traveling and being snoopy, when we do go somewhere for the weekend, we look at other flower shops. We went to Omaha here a few weeks ago. I got on Google Maps, I typed Omaha florist. It pulled up the best ones with the highest rating. <coughs> Wrote down the addresses, figured out a little travel project trajectory, and while we were there visiting, we went snooped in the flower shops. 95% of them are really excited to talk to you. And, and our, our main thing, they, we go in and they think they're going to sell flowers. Say, Can we help you? No, we're just snoopy florists from Kansas traveling. When we travel, we check out other flower shops. And that's usually all it took to crack them open to absolutely spill their guts about everything you ever wanted to know about their business but were afraid to ask. <laughs> Two perks. One, we find new products and new methods. Two, that just became a business trip. It's a tax write-off. <laughs> Cha-ching. Social media, LinkedIn, YouTube, Google, all huge, huge things. My annual advertising budget. Are you sitting down, Dan? My annual advertising budget in the flower shop is $200. Annual. Now, my chamber dues are 220. If you consider that advertising rather than networking, we're looking at 420. <clears throat> That's less than 1%, Dan. What percent were you at? Let's see, it's a minimum of 4.5%. Oh, Lordy. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, because of these, because of word of mouth, because of our website, that, and because we don't have five flower shops in town, because we're down to two, we're at that point that Dad said in my childhood, if I was at two flower shops, by God, we better have one of them. Those reasons all contribute to why we're able to get away with such a low advertising account. So some challenges. Number one challenge is staffing. Finding good people that we can depend on, that we can trust, preferably that have floral design experience, that are not colorblind. I accidentally hired a colorblind gal once. That didn't go so well. <laughs> You can't discriminate, but if you tell her that you need carnation red ribbon and she comes back with maroon, it just doesn't fly so well. So staffing is a huge, huge, huge issue. Um, we've had floral designers that did not last one day with us. We just let one go that made it six weeks. We didn't make it to that 90-day point because the problems that we had were not People get to a certain age, it's hard to train certain things. There's certain skills that you cannot instill. If they've got a base set of skills and have that certain level of creativity and enthusiasm and jump in and go, awesome. But so, so few people do. The economy has been a little bit of a challenge. We opened in 2006. What happened shortly after mid-2006? Economic slump. What happened again in 2008 and 9? Economic slump. 
In spite of that, somehow we've been on a growth trajectory and not had a down year yet. There's been a couple months that were a little sketch, but for the most part, it's all averaged out to a growth curve. Um, with social media, time management, as all of you know, it's really easy to get lost in the time suck that is Facebook. I have that Pages app on my phone, and that allows me to just post to the business page and not get distracted by the funny puppy picture that was posted by my college roommate or something like that. Drama management is huge, too. I try to hop on to the swap and talks and all of those a couple times a week just to make sure nothing's being said about us that we don't like. And managing that is huge, huge, huge. Wasn't dance, but there was a restaurant here in the last week that somebody had gotten a kid's meal. I thought it was a very fine looking kid's meal. Did you see this post? They had opened up that and they were very displeased with that kid's meal. So they took a picture of it, posted it on the swap and talk. Before you knew it, there were 93 comments and a hundred and some likes and half a dozen shares of, my gosh, how could that restaurant be so awful? How could they give that out and expect me to feed it to my children? My kid's going to be hungry. That looks awful. Now, wait a minute, lady. If you've got a kid that's six years old or less, that is plenty of food. And if your kid is bigger, you shouldn't have ordered a kid's meal. <clears throat> But I stayed out of it. You got to have, it's really hard. Dad always told me growing up, don't say anything about anybody you wouldn't say to their face, which would be fine, except I'm not bashful. But I managed to contain myself and I did post on there. Financial management. Dan mentioned cash flow. Cash flow is huge. When I quit teaching in May of 2012, I did not start drawing a salary from the flower shop until second quarter of 2013. So I went about 10 months without drawing a salary and worked off of what I had saved in teaching and that allowed the business to get all that much stronger so that it could handle my additional salary when I uh, had come in full time. Risk management, uh, we're working with a lot of fresh product, a lot of it's from Ecuador, from Colombia, a lot of different places around. You've got to make sure that your coolers don't freeze. If your coolers freeze, all your flowers die, you lose thousands of dollars worth within minutes. I have an app in my phone that tweets and texts and has bells and whistles that go off if my cooler gets too hot or too cold. We went through a few small disasters before a prom once that we lost a thousand dollars worth of mini spray roses and mini orchids. Never again. And so even though there's expense to get those systems into place, it's really cheap insurance at the end of the day. And same thing with Dan's, if he, his tomatoes freeze, you got to pitch them. And so you've got to maintain all of those temperatures and things really, really close. Time and life management. Uh, bless my mother's heart. She has real trouble with this. Uh, she, she eats, sleeps, and breathes flower shop 24 hours a day. And then it'll be 10 o'clock in the evening, and I'll be down at their house. And we've got our three little recliners in a row, just like old people, trying to take a nice nap. It'll be at 1030 at night, and she will think of something that is just really pertinent. By God, we've got to discuss it now. And my rule is you have no serious conversations after nine o'clock at night because somebody's going to get pissy and start yelling. And so, and I, over time, I've gotten that to where she's learned that that is probably a good rule. But my deal is when I go out the flower shop door and I lock the door, I shut off the flower shop. And then personal life starts. I can think about farm. I can think about cows. I can think about social life, those types of things. And you'll find that a lot of people have trouble flipping that switch in their mind. They're constantly, if there's something that's worrying them about the business, it doesn't just worry them from nine to five, it worries them all the way around the clock. And so that is a, a learned thing. If you can teach yourself to become a little bit emotionally detached, at least on a time basis to when you go home, you worry about you, you don't worry about the business. Huge, huge challenge. So that's my two cents. I had a few notes that I took as Dan was going along there. Let's see, cash flow. Flowers are a luxury item. People see them as a luxury item. Um, a lot of people have perception in their head that they cannot afford fresh flowers or that they have to go to the grocery store to get fresh flowers. Fortunately for us, it's hard to find grocery store flowers in Ottawa. That may be different when the new price chopper opens. We'll deal with that later. Uh, we started in about year one doing what's called $5 Friday flowers. And it started out as an opportunity to clean flowers out of the cooler that we'd had for a few days that we wanted to move. And say, here's this $5 wrap special that you can take home and put in your own base. Didn't make a lot of margin on it, but didn't have any loss and didn't have any waste. That has developed into a big enough program at this point that I 
get a, I get in about four trucks of fresh flowers a week. I get in two on Monday, one to two Wednesday, and usually one on Friday. And we are at the point that I order in fresh flowers on Friday morning to be able to handle Friday flowers. It's defeated the purpose of cleaning out the cooler because we don't have that problem anymore, but invariably people buy other things when they come in for that low margin item. They'll come in and they'll get some chocolate truffles, they'll get a stuffed animal, they'll get a balloon. They'll see a bigger arrangement in the cooler and say, gosh, she'd really like that. I think I'm going to splurge. To me, that's cheap insurance for a happy weekend, guys. Very cheap. Uh, cash flow. Dan mentioned donations. Our rule with donations, there's people every day that come in and ask for money. Our rule is that it either needs to be something local that we're really passionate about, or it needs to be directly connected to one of our customers. When it is somebody from Waverly or Emporia or Paola or Garnett that we have don't know from Adam, we don't know the people or the organization that supports and they've never set foot in our business before until they wanted money, chances are once they get what you're giving them, they're not going to come back until they need something again and they say, hey, that flower shop gave us some money, but because they're not one of our customers, they're not coming back. So really think about your donation dollars as community investment and as advertising. Am I, are you going to get a payback off of this? Um, some other challenges, being male in a female dominated world, I'm a third generation straight male florist. That is a hellacious little thing to come up against because if mom goes to the counter first and she's got 20 years of banking experience, she has zero floral experience and you will not get her to make you an arrangement. But people assume when they come in that the lady is the florist in a flower shop and they'll start telling her what they want. And mom's line is, don't tell me, tell the boys. And they look over and they see dad nine cowboy boots, but he's a farmer. But yeah, but he's also got a floral design degree. You might tell him what you want. He put it together, I can't. So that, that's been a huge, huge challenge. Um, I did not anticipate when I was getting my agriculture degree that I would end up being a wedding consultant and an interior decorator but we've ended up doing both, and I really enjoy doing both. Uh, skeptics are huge. Uh, we had a bank that had accepted our loan when we first got in, we went to renew it, and they wanted to pull everything that we had as collateral. Our farm, every vehicle, our homes, everything that we had, we, they wanted to pull in as collateral. And that vice president of that local bank at that time said it did not matter what he pulled as collateral, we were doomed to fail and he would be collecting all of it within three years. And that, quite frankly, forgive my language, pissed us off. Uh, and so we changed banks and within three years now we're, we're set this year to triple our gross from 2010. Just to spite him and we smile and we shake his hand every chance we get just to remind him that we still exist. <coughs> Hannah's had fun with that same banker. Uh, wire services, you see the ads for Teleflora, FTD, 1-800-Flowers, all of those types of things. Huge trip off, never go there. So if, let's say um, Amanda was in Oklahoma City and Garrett wanted to send Amanda flowers, and Garrett really misses Amanda, he wants to send $100 worth of flowers. So he gets on Teleflora.com, FTD, 800-Flowers, net, any of those websites, and clicks on, and selects an arrangement it's just gorgeous, fantastic picture, $100. Okay, first thing that you need to know, the picture that you're seeing on that website, it looks like an all the way around, around arrangement. It's not, every flower is arranged to the front for a good picture. The second thing you need to know, they're gonna charge you a sending fee. It's 10 to $20 plus a delivery fee that's about twice what a local shop does. So you're gonna spend about 130 bucks on this $100 flower arrangement. By the time the corporate fees are pulled out for Teleflora FTD, this is going to make you feel really good about your franchise agreement. By the time all the fees are pulled out, Teleflora and FTD, Garrett's $130, when it gets to the flower shop in Oklahoma City, is going to be $63. He will have lost 28% plus his delivery plus his sending fee. And that flower shop is going to be told to send out a $100 flower arrangement, including delivery, for Garrett. Are they going to do it? They can't afford to do it. That 28% is their salary, it's their lunch, it's their advertising, it's, I mean, that's, that's a huge chunk of their margin. And so consequently, we've heard of $80 arrangements through FTD showing up in teacups, because after the corporate fees are sent out, that's all that flower shop can afford to send out. And so our biggest recommendation is if you need flowers in another town, 
Get on Google, find one that has a really good listing, call them locally, tell them what you want, and order with a debit or credit card over the phone. And if you receive flowers from people out of town and you think that they might be using those wire services, I'll give you a card at the end of the day. You can give them our toll-free number and they won't have that wire fee. That's a, a huge, huge <coughs> issue with our industry is that, that big fee coming out. Uh, pulling a salary, larger expenses, yada, yada, yada. The only other thing I was going to mention is letting things go. When we first started, mom and dad were full-time. I was part-time. If something was done, we did it. Dad designed all the flowers. Mom delivered all of it, did all the books. And as we have grown and tripled in the last five years, we're at the point now where we, on any given day, have five to six people in the shop. On Valentine's, we have 15 or 16. Being able to find a team that you can release certain tasks to but you normally were the one or the holy noble ruler of that task and being okay with them doing it a little bit different but still to a certain specification is really really hard and so being comfortable with delegating those is, is probably one of the most difficult things i've had to learn as an entrepreneur questions thoughts grievances I would reiterate that when you said about the control thing that in some way I have a small fry. Most of us yes. have many, many, many stores. But I cannot, I just found that I have a hard time delegating. I like that. I'm too much of a control freak. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I have a hard time doing that. And so, and so consequently, hard. there's yeah. still a certain number of things that they just know that we do. Um, Depending on who walks in the door, there's certain customers that those are Sean's customers, and there's certain customers that those are Kathy's customers or they're Lyle's customers. And we know that depending on who it is coming in the door and what they're going to want, a certain one of us needs to handle it. Uh, generational growth pain is also huge. Uh, Dad learned floral design in the 60s from a guy that learned floral design in the 30s. And so even though he's a fantastic designer, a lot of his methods and techniques and materials are a little bit on the dated side. I learned from him, so I learned a lot of the 60s techniques, but I also updated them, and that's what's allowed us to get published in things like Florist Reviews, because it's there's some new methods in there, but convincing the previous generation that the new generation is okay can be a huge, huge challenge. You have a magic number for uh, materials costs that you try to target, some of the demand and food costs? And uh, staff percent, or staffing and salary percentage, I try to be under 19%. When, when you price out a flower arrangement, it usually is about 20% labor. When you do wrapped flowers for them, put in their own base, it's around 10% labor just because it's so, so much quicker and doesn't take very long. Uh, so if we can hit that sweet spot, I think I've been in that 17 and a half, 18% the last couple of years on staffing. Uh, cost of goods, if it was just flowers, it would be totally different than because it's flowers and giftware. There's a lot of, of the giftware types of things that are, are keystone. Uh, for instance, if it is a uh, $9.99 Woodwick candle, our cost is five bucks, and then you try to double your money on that. Uh, then there's a lot of a lot of companies are using a Keystone Plus, which takes care of their shipping. On heavier wood and metal and glass items, you've about got to do a Keystone Plus because that shipping is is 15% on top of your wholesale cost. If I was just doing flowers, I would want my cost of goods to be down there in that 32%, somewhere in there. Because we have so many keystone items, I'm usually in the low 40s. And for comparison's sake, for our labor, we used to be down around 20%, but now it's just keeping more closer to the 20 percent probably. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely, great questions. Other questions? I think we're hitting senior 915 time slot. So if you guys want to uh, thank Sean for, for coming and talking. <laughs> oh, if you guys have any questions afterwards, feel free to ask us too. I know they've got business cards. Um, you click we'll on the back, you can find me on social media too. With future classes and projects. So I appreciate you guys coming um, to be guests in our class. We're really excited about uh, about oh, yeah, that. Oh, you nice to borrow it, guys. Cheap food. Thank you for that. On behalf of the I mean, I'll be that. I always say that. Twice a year. Oh, it's totally.
Okay. Yeah, I think that's all. But you pay for cheap insurance. We've got a little card of a guy from the Some of the money comes back in the local region, like Kansas City market. Oh, and they'll have your local advertising because then they, then they choose how to spend that money. And sometimes you can do local things and get reimbursed. They'll have fair share of things that they don't think they have equal coverage. The stuff is kind of way that says. I think they think more on social media and everything else. They, one thing that looks at correct me after is this designer that's no longer with us that lasted six weeks had, had commented that. And to mom and got eaten because commented that well Sean's always got Facebook up on his computer. He didn't do anything anyway. <laughs> she just about ate 
Yeah. What was the app? Yeah, so the one thing you weren't being totally fair about is all your labor that goes into it was, that's, that's true. true. That's, that's, true. that's <laughs> a little more than 200. Uh, it is. It is. But that's I'm not actually well. writing a check. Sure, I get it. Yeah. But, it, but it's very yeah. yeah. because it's like, well, wait a minute. We booked entire weddings across Facebook Messenger. We have people order for funerals across Facebook. I have to have Facebook for uh, I would miss orders. So. But what's yeah. that app that you said you can do so that you don't get distracted with your personal Oh, well, stuff. Facebook has what's called Pages app. I just got this phone here, so you don't have it on there yet. But it's the white little logo with an orange flag, and it just lets you log into your business page and upload posts and things to get and schedule them. Is so it meant for like the kind of employees <laughs> that are supposed to be you monitoring? Can, you can kind of yeah, channel them into this yeah, so you can and give them stuff. different levels of administrative right. rights too, where they can post or they can post yeah. and edit. Yeah, and, and it's nice too because where you would have had to have taken a picture, upload to the computer, upload on there, I can take a picture, hit post, add a message, send, and within five seconds I have a new post on our business Facebook and I'm on to something else. And I got my, uh, I can't think what, it's one of those businesses that looks at your social media productivity. 16% Twitter. I would not have guessed that my Twitter was nearly that large of a percentage. But 16% of our traffic is coming from Twitter oh. now. You know, traffic is a, is a gift or a reader. You know, so maybe it's right. Right. Now, it's our business time wise, Twitter or Facebook is much more effective. So, with a good post, I can reach 2,000 people with a good business Facebook post. And that, which is, is mind blowing. But, and then you think about, gosh, how big of an ad would you have to pull out in a newspaper oh, yeah. to guarantee that 2,000 people would see it? And of those 2,000 people, how many are interested in your product and are actually going to act on it? Or is the 2,000 people that I engage or 2,000 people that click, yes, I want information from that? Or and in 1983, it might have been just as a fact. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, that money spent dollar for dollar might have been the same impact, but it doesn't today. And that's the majority of the town got the newspaper out. And either on today when it was new, or their neighbor gave it to them tomorrow when it was a day old. And <clears throat> just not not there anymore. And that, that's a whole world. I'm not even. Well, <laughs> and you have some limitations yeah. when you're working with yeah. franchises. Yeah. You got the luxury of too. Yeah, they, they kind of handle that for you. Though. So yeah, they do. We do have things like the subway app now and things like that. But, um, <clears throat> Really, yeah, yeah. that people can win the word and just walk up But social media is so much, right? So you know, important.